We're going to be in 1 John chapter 5, really verse 19. Um, last week we looked at verse 18, and John says there's a couple of things you guys should know. And the idea that we know is the idea that these are steadfast, unmovable, you know, foundational truths of Christianity. And, uh, you know, in verse 18... He says, we know that whoever is born of God does not sin. And we looked into that. And because of the, the verb and the usage and the, the tenses in there, it, it's he cannot abide in sin. He cannot continue in sin. He, that can't be his lifestyle anymore. You know, he, he's been moved out of that. And, and by that, we know that there's a difference now. The power of sin has been broken in the Christian. It's been broken. You can actually say no. It's weird how that works. Uh, we are no longer slaves of sin. I don't know if you've ever been a slave of sin. I have. And when it owns you, it's a terrible master. He goes on to say, in verse 18, We know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself. And we looked into that, and it's, it's literally... The he should be capitalized. He who has been born of God, it's he who has been begotten of God, the only begotten of God. Jesus now watches over the believer, watches over him, not himself. And then we know that whoever is born of God does not sin. He who has been born of God keeps himself. And the wicked one does not touch him. We looked at that word touch. It means to grasp, to hold on to, to get you in his clutches. And the idea is that Satan can never get you back into his clutches. And we, we, we were, you know, I was blown away at that. I, I love that blessed assurance that we have. We are now his. And so, you know, all of those things wind up to verse 19. Notice I go to the same place that John goes to. We know that we are of God. Isn't that where that leads you? You know, we know, hey, we can't live in sin anymore. We know the wicked one doesn't touch us. We know that Christ is keeping us. And we know we can be assured. We can have this absolute foundational statement. We are of God. And the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. John divides all of humanity the same way all of the New Testament does into two categories. You know, there's the we and the world. Oh, I grew up, we are the world. Wait a minute. You know, um... There's the saved and the unsaved. There's the believer and the unbeliever. There's the Christian and everyone else, John says. That is the Christian worldview. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to stretch some of you today. John 15, 19. If you were of the world, Jesus says, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Notice what Jesus says there. No, no, I chose you out of this place. John 17, 9. Jesus again, he says, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. You know, you think about in Hebrews chapter 11, as he's going through that hall of faith, here's all those guys, you know, here's Abraham and Abel and Enoch and Noah and all of these heroes of the faith. And Hebrews 11, 13 says this, these all died in faith, not having received the promises. You know, if you ever want a verse on faith, what faith looks like, Hebrews 11, 13. But having seen them afar off, they saw these promises of God. They were assured of them. Isn't that interesting? They knew them. They, they believed them. They held on to them and embraced them and confessed that they were just strangers and pilgrims down here on earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come, that old life, that old world, that old place where they used to be, 
They would have had an opportunity to return, but now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. 2 Corinthians 6.14 Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? What communion has light with darkness? Therefore, come out from among them and be separate. That's God's call to the whole world. So this idea, this picture, there's the Christian and there's the whole rest of the world, that will define, that will determine how you live in this world. As we see the wars, as we see racism, as we see, you know, government activities the way they are and social ideas just pouring out. There's abortion and there's pride celebrations and there's so much stuff going on. And we watch the whole world grow worse and worse. You got to understand that's a biblical concept. Oh, Mark, let's save the world. Sorry, not biblical. Not biblical. This world is temporary. This world is for a time and for a purpose. You know? But is that how you see it? It's my attitude towards this verse that will determine my conduct and my behavior. You know, what the, what the news is reporting. What social media is pushing. What everybody with an agenda is, is pushing and calling. What the governments are implementing. All of that stuff, this world is pushing a ton of ideas and thoughts into you, at you. And uh, it's only those who have a biblical worldview and who run all of those ideas, all of those thoughts through their biblical filter. That's what I call it. You should know your Bible well enough that when an idea hits you, you should be able to run through there, run it through that filter and go, what comes out? Junk, get rid of it. What comes, what comes out? Truth, hey, hang on to that. So do I agree with this verse? That there are Christians and then every other single individual, billions upon billions of these people on planet Earth that are just called the world. The Christians are all alone. They are of God. And the entire rest of the world lies under the sway of the evil one. Hmm. What a statement. I mean, what just an in-your-face statement. John says it shouldn't be hard to spot a Christian. <laughs> They're not merely people who have added a little something to their life. Or people who are slightly better than their neighbor. Oh no, they are people who belong to a totally different realm. There's an utter difference. It's black and white. Can you imagine a greater difference? These people belong to God. And these people lie under the sway of Satan. Is there a greater difference anywhere? This is not subtle. It is not slight. We are of God and all the rest of the world lies under the sway of Satan. So let me ask again, is that your worldview? And understand, Christians are not saying this about Christians. God is saying this about Christians. God is saying this about our world. Because there are come some people who, who they read a statement like this and they go, oh, Mark, you are so prideful. 
Do you hear what you're saying? Oh, I'm special. I'm unique. I'm above all of this stuff. But that is not what John is saying. Do you understand that? That's not his attitude. His attitude is not pride. He, is, he hasn't suddenly become a pharisaical, you know, fool. He's not arrogant. This is the apostle of love, as most people call him. This is the apostle of love, humbly saying, thankfully saying, this is what God has done to the Christian. If you don't understand this, and if you can't see it, something is terribly wrong with your vision, with your understanding, with your worldview. And we're going to look into that. We're going to look into this absolute division that John brings up. This cleft. One of today's problems in the church is that for the last hundred years, the church has tried to become the world. Oh, let's do this and let's become that and let's get this involved and let's do that so we fit in. We're not supposed to fit in. We're supposed to be absolutely unique, absolutely different. You know, one of the reasons the church is powerless today is because there's no difference between them and the world. One of the reasons the church is so unhappy today is because there's no difference. You ever had a friend come up to you and go, why, why would I go to your church? What do you guys have that we don't have? I sit at home and I do nothing and I got everything you got. What's the, what's the big deal? Look back into history and you'll find out that when the church stood distinct and unique, the church was powerful. The church was effective. The church was used by God. It was the greatest influence in the world at those times. Don't you understand the world? All those people out there, they expect you to be different. They expect there to be something different about you. Sometimes they'll even hold you accountable. Christians do that, you know? <laughs> so let's start by looking at this backwards. Let's start by looking at the world first. What does John mean by the world? John means this world's life and this world's organization without God. Everything that goes on down here that they push God out of. Now just think about the last hundred years in America. What have we pushed God out of? Everything! That's the world, by the way. It's the outlook and mentality of man without God. Not bringing God into the thought into the action, not bringing God into the conversation, leaving him outside. It's life controlled by man's will, man's thought, and man's desire. That's the world. And John says, the whole world, <laughs> the whole world, all of it in its entirety, everything in that place, not just those gutter dwellers, you ever met any of those? Guy sleeping it off, you know, on the park bench or on a heating grate. And I remember walking through Washington, D.C., and a lot of the buildings had these grates out where the heat exchangers were, and there were people just sleeping on those. The drug dealers, the alcoholics. Oh, it's not just them. It's the best people in this world. It's the highly educated. It's the highly esteemed. It's the scientists and the professors. It's these benevolent societies. It's even most of the religious people. John points at that and he says, that is all under the sway of the evil one. It's the best and the worst of mankind. The Christian view is this. All of that lies under the sway 
of the evil one. See, it isn't because the world lacks understanding or knowledge. You ever run across people like that? Oh, if we, if we just educated people better. Oh, if we just had a better you know, financial system and everybody got what they needed and you know, they bring in all of these social issues. Oh, if we just had the right political movement or if we could just straighten out biology, you know? Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. The problem is much deeper than that. The problem is this world is being entirely controlled by an evil power, by an evil person. A guy called the wicked one. And here we come face to face with the biblical doctrine of sin and the biblical doctrine of the devil. You know, Jesus talking in the Luke eleven twenty one, he says, When a strong man, fully armed, guards his palace, his goods are at peace. But when a stronger one comes, oh, that strong man, that's Satan in this world. He's, he's guarding this place. He's got it under control. He's got it locked down. John 12, 31. Now is the judgment of this world. And notice the words. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Satan is called the ruler of this world. Ephesians 2. You he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all used to walk. Hmm. Second Corinthians 4.4, 4, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. The God of this age. Are you picking up on these terms that are biblical terms about this one that is controlling this world? Revelation 12.10, the accuser of the brethren. Now, I thought only those people were on Facebook. I see them all the time. Oh, the church would just do that, and the church would just do this, you know. No, no, no. You, know? you see, to believe the Christian worldview, you must believe that there is Satan, that there is a, an enemy. There is an evil person, and he is controlling the life and the movement and the activities on this planet and in those people. God created all of creation, and when he gets done, he goes, man, that is awesome. That is perfect. That is exactly the way I wanted it to be. Well, sure, they can be this. Oh, you missed the verse, didn't you? You missed Genesis chapter 3, where it all just crumbled, where it was all destroyed. What went wrong? In Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve are there, and God gives them one idea. I don't want you to do this. Satan comes and whispers in their ear, and he says, Oh, God's just hiding stuff from you. You could be much more than you really are if you just obey me, and they choose to obey him. And the Bible says very carefully, do you not know that whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey. Whether to sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. And when they chose to obey the evil one, they became his slaves, his servants. And every since Genesis chapter 3, man has listened to and obeyed the evil one. It's naturally what we do. And as a result, the whole world lies under his control. <laughs> All of its activities, you don't have to look very far to see evil. All of its entertainments, all of its politics, the whole world. That is the Christian view. 
This world is positively evil and is being governed by an unseen spiritual power. And you find that all the way through the Bible. Now remember Jesus in his temptation. You know, he gets baptized, the Holy Spirit drives him into the wilderness where he's tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. Do you remember Matthew chapter 8 or Matthew chapter 4? says again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory and said to him all these things I will give unto you if you fall down and worship me did you hear how Satan makes this claim for himself all of this belongs to me and I can give it to whomever I choose and Jesus doesn't stand there and go you liar Jesus doesn't stand there and say, no. Oh, Jesus just says, shut up, you know. He's claiming for himself this glory, this ability, this kingdom. And some people would say, oh, Mark, you're missing the point. Look at, look at what mankind has done in the last several hundred years. Look at all the good things that have happened. <laughs> and I like to smile when people say that. Because if you would just look into those good things that happened, mankind was perishing without proper health care, without doctors. And so Christians came and built hospitals and became doctors. And they set these things up. Well, people were dying without proper knowledge of the Lord, and so they set up colleges. Christians started colleges, by the way, higher education. Christians started lower education, schools. Hmm. Christians started labor unions. But have you noticed what's happened with all of those good things? They've become evil. Hospitals, all about the bottom line. It's not about helping people anymore, it's about money. Colleges, oh, it's not about helping people anymore. It's not about producing Christians. It's about producing worldly people with worldly outlooks. Huh. Labor unions, money, power. See, evil can't create, but evil can steal. And that is exactly what's happening. But the ultimate test of this world being evil simply comes down to this. What is man's attitude towards God? And especially, what is man's attitude toward Jesus Christ? <laughs> the final test isn't your morality. Or are we polite? Or are we educated? The final test is, are we opposed to God? Are we opposed to Jesus Christ being the only way to the Father? Are we opposed to this alone being the Word of God? Are we opposed To a salvation that doesn't really involve you. It had to be done by him and nothing can be added to it by you. <laughs> Are you opposed that there's a right, that there's a wrong, and there is coming a day of judgment when you will stand face to face before your maker? Now, as I read through those things, can you feel the oppression already? I do. Every time I read through it. Well, there's right and wrong. <laughs> you know? There's truth and there's error. <laughs> you know? There's Christianity. There's Jesus Christ and Him righteous. And there's everything else. And this is right and that is all junk. And <laughs> everything in this world and everything around me suddenly kind of tremors and it's like oh you can't you can't say that you can't be black and white like that 
from Jesus when he came. He says, this is the condemnation of the world. That light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Men like where they are. I like it over here. It's dark and I can get away with murder and I like it and I can do what I want to do. You see, this enemy has created enmity in you between you and God. Enmity. There's a war going on. You read his Ten Commandments. I don't like those. Especially that one. That keeps all the fun out. No, no, no. That can't be right. Enmity is your unwillingness to bow before your maker. It's, un, it's your unwillingness to honor and obey and worship him. To be in a right relationship with the Most High God. That's our world's problem today. They're not in the right relationship. They're at war with him. They're supposed to be at peace with him. And they're being controlled by an evil being who is keeping them away from God by the use of everything he can find, by the use of science, evolution. That's true science. There's nothing true science about evolution. Nothing. I'm not a scientist, but I'm a thinker. If evolution was still happening, you know, some monkey somewhere turn into a man. Oh, well, it was, it was graduated evolution. It just happened in little spurts. There hasn't been a spurt for over 2,000 years, 4,000 years. When do these spurts happen? How come the oldest frog we've ever found is a frog? He's keeping you away by higher education. This is the answer. Knowledge is power. Baloney. Knowledge is meaningless unless you figure out the wisdom to use it. Unless you gain the wisdom to use it. Oh, it's, it's all about morality. And you will find these all the way through the years. You know, you remember back 150 years ago. Some of you guys will remember that far. Um, 150 years ago, they had these, these tolerance societies where they wanted to wipe out alcohol and they wanted to do this and they wanted to do that. And they're marching around kind of in a Christian ethic. Some churches even did this. That is not Christianity. What are you doing? Christianity is not morality. It's not going to be by politics. You know, we're not going to get the next great, wonderful president and he's going to save everything. Oh, it's never happened and it's not going to happen. It's not going to come by religion. Because religion, you know, in the, in the Latin, it's relangere. It's the idea of man relinking with God. And I got news for you. You're a little late because God has already relinked with man through the cross, through Jesus Christ. All of those other things are a lie. That is the biblical view of this world. The problem is a spiritual problem. Men and women must be converted. You might call it born again born of God. That they must come into a right relationship with God. They must move out of this, be moved out of this enmity into this loving, personal relationship. They must become a new creation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We, we must be removed from the grip of the evil one and put into the grip of our loving father and his son. So with that as the backdrop, now let's look at the first statement in this verse. 
We are of God. Bang. This is what John started writing to us about. You remember how he started? Oh, there's this fellowship that's available between the Father and the Son and the rest of the church, and we can all be involved in this fellowship, this joy, this communion, and there can be great joy in this place. But the world we just looked at is everything that tries to bring you satisfaction without that relationship, outside of that relationship. Oh, but we Christians, we know. And there it is. We know we are of God. <laughs> there is no doubt about it. I don't need to debate it with anybody. This is not something I'm hoping to achieve. One day, I hope I'm okay with God. What a foolish idea. Because it's available right now. It's not something I'm trying to achieve. One day, I'll get to this high peak and that'll be my attainment. It's, that's worldliness, not Christianity. It's not something I'm working towards or trying to achieve. It is a present fact with the Christian. I am now of God. End of story. I have been saved. I am redeemed. Colossians 1.3, it's always been one of my, 1.13, it's always been one of my favorite. He has delivered us from the power of darkness. Now get this picture. God has delivered you out of this world. He's delivered you out of the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. He's put you on this conveyor belt and you're there. You may be running backwards, but you're there. God has done this for me. He has brought it about. I know that. 1 John 5, 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. We have this assurance. We know. So what does John mean by we are of God? Well, firstly, the way to look at this is it's a complete contrast with the world. It's an absolute contrast to all those other statements I've just been talking about. The whole world lies under the sway of the evil one. That ain't us. We're the opposite of that. Christians have been taken out of the clutches of the wicked one. We saw that last week. We stand in this life, having begun in that dark place, having begun in the world, but now having been t taken out of that world. For the believer, at some point, walking around in this life, you noticed God was working for you, in you, with you, about you. He began to open your eyes. He began to draw you. Or like with me, he just took me. Almost in a moment, you're mine. Galatians 1, 4. Who gave himself for our sins that we, he might deliver us from this present evil age. The reason he went to that cross, to deliver you from that world. And it's an evil world. Christ saw us in the clutches of the evil one, being manipulated and blinded and used and misused. And he gave himself for us and has delivered us by his finished work upon the cross. 
so though we are still in this world, we are no longer of this world. We've been taken out of it. John 15, 19. If you were of this world, the world would love its own. I just read this. Yet because you are not of this world, but I chose you out of this world, therefore the world doesn't really like you. Right? First Peter 2, 9. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we are of God. We're, we're now in his realm, right? We're of his kingdom. We belong to him. We have been forgiven. We have been pronounced justified from the very throne of God. There's been this gavel drop. Boom! That one is justified. Not sinless. Justified. Just as if I'd never sinned. He's given us his own righteousness. Imputed it to us. We have been reconciled. That means that enmity that used to be in there is gone. All of that is his doing. Hmm. All of that is his choice for me. We have become born again. We are now new creations in Christ Jesus. We have become partakers of the divine nature. And now we are children of God. What amazing things happen to a Christian. It's not that you changed your mind. It's not that you chose to believe a couple of things God may have said. No, it's God doing something for you, to you, with you. And now instead of being at war, we desire his rules. Isn't that weird? The very rules I didn't like before. I desire him to own me completely. Oh God, change me, transform me, get rid of this out of there. And I want more of that. And, you know, his dominion over me. Oh, I want that. We now love him. We long to obey him. We want to be controlled by him. Just as Satan holds sway over this world, we want God to hold sway over us. We want to be governed by God, right? Jacob and Israel. <laughs> so why doesn't everybody come to this place? If it's so amazing, if it's so wow, how come nobody comes? Have you never read 2 Corinthians 4.4? 4? Whose minds the God of this age has blinded I told you, the God of this age is at work in those people. He's blinding them. They cannot believe because they cannot see. They don't understand. The evil one is presenting or preventing them from understanding. The devil holds men and women in his own grasp by persuading them about one thing. <laughs> oh, sweetie. It would be in your best interest not to go to that church. It would be in your best interest not to really think about God too deeply. And here comes self-centeredness, selfishness, and self-seeking. How does Satan blind people? I get in the way. You get in the way. They get in the way. It's what I want. It's my will, my desires. And that is the opposite of being in God's control. John's been telling us about this, you know, back in 1 John chapter 1. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If we say we're Christians and yet persist in that old lifestyle, persist in sins, Persist, persist under the sway of the evil one, then we're liars. The truth is not in us. 
no, there must be a change. I've always talked about the change. You meet a Christian and you start talking, and next thing you know, that they tell you something about their past, and you go, you? I can't even picture you a drunk. I can't even picture you chasing girls and carousing and doing all of that. Yeah, that's because there's been a change, and it wasn't me changing. It was God changing me. Christianity isn't a profession. It isn't me striving to be a bit better than I used to be last week. Christianity is God working in you and through you and for you and about you. You are no longer what you used to be. You're still the same who, but you're not what you used to be. There is, beyond any doubt, in every Christian sitting in here, a before Christ life and an after Christ life. <laughs> and it is black and white. It is just glaringly obvious. And then you remember how John goes through his whole book and he puts all of these tests in place. Let's just test that new life that's in you. You want to make sure you have this new life. So let's test it. You know, are you keeping the commandments? Do you love the brethren? Do you know the doctrine? Are you in his word? Are you studying and reading? Do you love God? And how all of those things affect each other. It's this continuous chain. It's not one or the other. It's all of them. And that is the proof of life. Everlasting life. Or you can look at Paul as he uses the illustration of the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Singular, by the way. And it's, it shows itself up as joy and peace and long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You know, it's interesting in that passage because in Galatians 19, he lists out what this world does, you know? Here's the works of the flesh, of the self. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heres oh, evil, murders, drunkenness, reviling, you know, all of that stuff. That's all self. Fruit of the Spirit is anything but self. You know, through the Spirit is love. <laughs> you get to Corinthians 13. Love suffers long and is kind. How are you doing on that one? How's the fruit growing there? Because Mark suffers for two minutes and is a jerk, you know? Oh, I'm getting better. Our world tells us all about us. What the world feeds you is all about you. It's all about self-reliance. It's all about your learning and your education and your self-confidence and you being able to do what you want to do. In fact, in this world, everything becomes about you. We must save the planet. Ever heard it? It's up to you. You got to lower your, you know, carbon footprint. And down there on that island like a month ago, that one island had a little burp, a little eruption, you know, out of a volcano and released more greenhouse gases than humans have ever done in totality on Earth. And yet we're supposed to lower the carbon footprint. I guess we'd need a bigger cork in that thing. I don't know. What foolishness we are believing because we think life is all about this world, all about this planet, all about us. And we have left somebody out. Another way of our viewing us being of God is we are destined for God now. We are headed his way. We are coming into his presence. We are his. We're going to spend eternity, eternity, eternity with him. Our inheritance is already booked there. Have you read? It's reserved in heaven in your name. And it can't fade away. It can't rust away. It can't disappear. It's there. 
waiting for you. Not because we've earned it. Not because we deserve it. It is the sole result of the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because he came into this world, the one we've been talking about. And because he completed and offering a finished work upon the cross. And it was all accomplished for us. And now freely he offers you. Come to me. Come with me. Freely. That word always means undeservedly. Oh, I'm not worthy, Mark. Oh, I need to earn it. I'm not good enough. Well, no kidding. You know? See, this isn't pride. No, no, no. This isn't me saying, look at what I've become and look at what I've done and look at where, you know, all of that stuff. No, this is pure praise. This is giving all glory and honor and praise unto Him because that's where it all belongs. What a profound sense of gratitude being a Christian brings you. Because every time you think about it, you go, why me? Why would he do that in me? I, I don't get it. Neither do I. But God somehow interrupted me one day. And he, he drew me to himself and he opened my eyes. And he did all of this stuff. I was on the highway to hell. Anybody else on that highway? I was a hell-deserving sinner. And I was kind of planning on it. Well, that's where all my buddies are going to be, you know. And I was on my way there. And God one day interrupted me and took me from that highway, that freeway to hell, and put me over here on his narrow path. I've been translated into his kingdom. Oh, I've met some who call themselves Christians. And all they can talk about is self. Look at me, I'm doing this, and I'm wearing that, and I've got this, and I attend there, and I've got my membership here, and I, I've gone through all of these rites and rituals, and I, I'm doing all of this stuff, and my heart breaks for them because it's all about self. It's all about them. That is not Christianity. Christianity is all about him. Him. I want to be like Paul who in 1 Corinthians 15 says this, but by the grace of God I am what I am. The only other time I've ever heard that was Popeye, you know. I am what I am, you know. But uh, here is Paul saying, I didn't bring myself here. I didn't transform myself. I didn't do any of this stuff. I am what I am because he is doing all of this through me. So to summarize, this world is not something that is gradually improving, but it's growing worse and worse. It's growing darker and darker. Christ came not to save this world, but to save sinners and the ungodly out of this world. And then once we are saved, now it is our task to look at this world and go, how can we limit evil? And how can we save those hell-destined sinners? It's interesting, in Isaiah 45, 7, God says this, I form the light. We know that. We like that. I create darkness. Oh, I don't know if I like that. I make peace and I create evil. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Well, he's the only one that can create. So he had to create evil. But if he created it, that means he's controlling it. So how come we're not praying, oh God? Back the evil out of this place. Remove those evil things. Lord, bring light. Bring your glory. 
This world is temporary. It's doomed to destruction. I've read the story. I know how it's going to work. But those of this world, those unbelievers, they have a soul that is more valuable than anything else on this planet. And our goal must be, how can we reach them? So we got to start talking to God about that. God, who do you want me to reach? How do you want me to reach them? What do you want to use? Lord, I'm, I'm here. Just show me and tell me and walk me through it and be with me and let's go do that. We got to get our eyes off all of those shiny new things, right? <gasps> Have you seen the new world? Nothing new about it. In 20 years, you'll see that thing in the wrecking yard. And you go, I remember when I really used to like those. It was such a flash in the pan. You see, God desires that none should perish, but all come to repentance. That must become our desire. If God desires it, I want it to be my desire. We must pray earnestly for the lost. Right? And then we must walk in this world to get their attention, that they might see light, that they might see peace, they might see joy, that you might be that gentle person with them, that kind one, that long-suffering one. Oh, this world is filthy, it is dirty, it is evil. So never remember what he told us in 1 John chapter 1. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin, washes us com continually. It's the bath that we need, right? But then we walk through daily and we get this world, you know, it kind of it splashes up on us. We need our feet washed. And we come to 1 John 1, 9, and he says, if we confess... He is faithful and he is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We need to be quick to see it, quick to spot it, quick to take our feet, take our bodies to him and say, Lord, wash me of this. And then chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. That's the goal. And if anyone does sin, that's the truth, Right? We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins. He himself has paid already for your sin. That's where the Christian stands in this fallen world. We are of God. Own that statement. What a tremendous statement. We can know that. We're supposed to know that. So let us hold this right view of our world. Out there is corrupted, it's polluted, it's evil. They're never going to understand you. But that's okay. Because I'm supposed to be like a lamp that's lit and placed on a lampstand so they at least take notice of my light and it gives them enough light to walk around. Father, we come. Lord, we come thankful. Because as we sit here, we know. We know that we can't live in sin the way we used to live in sin. We, can't, we just can't do it. We know that the only begotten Son, He is the one that watches over us and keeps us from the evil one. And we know that evil one can never get his grasp on us again. And we know that we are of you. But the whole rest of this world is corrupted and blinded and cannot see and cannot discern and cannot know unless you open their eyes. And so, Father, we pray 
uh, that one at a time you would use us to shine your light upon them. And God, that you would then draw them out of this fallen world back into your kingdom. Father, we praise you and give you all glory. We praise our Lord Jesus Christ, who is worthy. And we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One's going to betray him. One's going to deny him. They're all going to flee from him. They're all going to be unbelievers in two days. They're all going to be unbelievers in two days. Isn't it crazy? They can't hang on to their faith for two days. Oh, we were hoping he was the one. He sits there and he goes, I couldn't hardly handle, I couldn't hardly wait until this day when we could sit down and we could do this together. Because what I'm about to do is gonna change your life. It's gonna take you from this world <laughs> and bring you into my Father's kingdom. Bring you into my kingdom. I'm about to do something that is the most astonishing act ever on planet earth I'm about to go to the cross and what I'm going to do there is I'm going to lay down my life and so this, this bread is going to represent my life and I'm about to lay it down for you and in doing that, what I want you to do is I want you to partake of my life and then I want you to lay down your life for them. Oh, they don't deserve it. They're unworthy. They hold on to faith like this and then the next day it's gone. And, you know, how could we ever lay down our life for somebody it doesn't seem like matters, it doesn't seem like they care. Seems like all they'll do is attack me. Oh, well, don't you understand? That's this world. But I'm going to bring you to a place where you don't have to worry about yourself anymore. You'll be taken care of. It's them I'm worried about. It's them I want to reach. And so as often as you do this, as often as you partake of this bread and of this cup, do that in remembrance of me. Do that understanding that I died Remember how you used to be at war with me? Remember how you used to be an unbeliever? Remember how we used to have those discussions and you would get all mad at me because I wasn't doing it your way? You remember all those times? But I'm going to lay that down. I'm going to lay this down. It's going to be broken and it's going to be bruised and it's going to be sweaty and it's going to be lifeless for three days and then it's coming back to life and then it's alive forever more so when we partake of his life we're, we're partaking of it all his birth his creation you know his his beginning in Mary's womb not really his beginning right and yet, into eternity. And we share His, and He shares with us because we're now everlasting beings, age abiding, where we will be with Him. But in this temporary separation, we want to show him that we partake, that we believe, that we want to bring him in and chew on him and figure him out and, and make a meal of him and live by him, by the power that he brings. 
So, Father, we come thankful that you prepared a body for Christ, that he came and he walked it out perfectly, that righteousness. And then he went to that cross, perfect obedience, and paid for my sins and our sins. And then gets up and offers us his righteousness that he worked out in this body and this flesh. Lord, we want to become partakers of that. We want to become partakers of everything Christ has to give us. And so thank you for this seemingly simple ceremony where we come to Christ knowing he is all we need, the bread of life. He will feed us. He will supply us. He will take care of us. Thank you, Father, for that. In Jesus' name. And then, better do that left-handed. Hmm. Um, he passes around that cup at the table. He says, this is my blood. This now represents my blood. And what an interesting idea. A guy talking about his death and his dead body and his blood being drained out at dinner the night before it happens. And he says, but this, is, this blood is interesting because it's not just my life. It is all of my life. But it's your gateway, your entryway into the new covenant. Not that old one based upon what you could do and what, what you could bring and how righteous you were and how worthy you were. But the new covenant that is based on faith about how righteous I was, how holy I was, and how perfect I was, and that I paid for all the flaws and all the wrongs and all the evils. This cup represents not his flesh, but his life, his very life blood. You know, you read like John 16, I'm the true vine, you're the branches. If my sap, if my life, if my blood runs through you, then you belong to me and I belong to you because we've become one. We want his blood to run through our veins. We want his life to be our life. We want to be empowered and endued and, and fruitful from him, from everything he brings. So Father, we come to you and we thank you that you gave him a life and you, you filled him with blood, with life, and that he willfully and willingly took our sins upon himself and cried out there at the last on the cross, it is finished. It is paid in full. Your sins have been washed white as snow. They've been removed as far as the east is from the west. And that we are washed in the blood of the Lamb. Righteous. Not because of us because of this and God we want to partake of that we want to trust in that we want to trust in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and what he has accomplished for us and God we thank you for that accomplishment praise you in Jesus name Amen mm -hmm.